Are you looking for the perfect way to take your brand to the next level? Want to reach a dedicated, engaged audience that's all ears? With Audiohook.com, you can do just that. Audiohook is the premier podcast advertising platform, connecting advertisers with some of the best podcasts in the world. Audiohook uses advanced targeting techniques to ensure your message reaches the right ears at the right time. With detailed analytics, you'll be able to track your campaign's performance and optimize your strategy for maximum impact. Plus, their team of experts are there every step of the way, providing guidance and support to make your campaign a success. So, whether you're a startup, a small business owner, or a marketing pro, Audiohook is your one-stop shop for podcast advertising success. Head over to audiohook.com to start your journey today. Every year, thousands of human remains are found in the United States. And in one of every four instances, authorities can't identify the body. That's starting to change. I'm Dave Killen, co-host of The Unidentifieds, a new limited series podcast from The Oregonian and Oregon Live. We go deep into several cold cases and explain the science that's helping experts give these long-forgotten people their names back. Look for The Unidentifieds after you've finished listening to this podcast. Subscribe to The Unidentifieds on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Man, after all the rain and wet weather in the tri-state area the last two days, it's sunny, it's shining, and what a better day than hope do you to get the sun sun shining on this edition of the strictly stripes podcast welcome into another edition of the podcast yours truly muhammad ahmad with you once again alongside andrew gillis and mike nislick to get halfway through the week we're gonna keep on pushing and pushing until we make it to the end of the week and we're gonna get there before you know it like it is not only wednesday we're already past the midway point in may which means we're getting closer to memorial day which means we're getting closer to summer uh, so I guess the indirect countdown begins. But before we get into today's order of business, we want to remind you guys to sign up for our Cincinnati Football Insider subtext service. Uh, we mentioned yesterday we were breaking all the news that we were getting uh, straight from Joe Burrow, straight from the locker room, uh, as we heard from Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, just to name a few guys that were talking yesterday, uh, what they said, what that means. And we did it before we got on the podcast before we put pen to paper, before we wrote anything for our online readers and subscribers, because the Cincinnati Football Insider subscribers are the cool kids on the block. Andrew, do you think people should be part of the cool kids on the block? I, I definitely think so. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I said this, I think yesterday, you know, you you look at, you know, kind of everything that's going on right now. You got transactional news. You've got offseason news. I mean, we today we just had the uh, preseason schedule finalized. It's just it's an easy way to kind of cut the line and, uh, you know, jump ahead of everybody on Twitter. Um, you know, you can hear our thoughts on uh, on the Bengals specifically. You don't have to kind of wade through all that other mess. Um, you know, you'll hear our thoughts to breaking news. You'll hear that first. You'll hear our analysis of that breaking news first. You'll hear all of it first. And I think that's kind of the big thing for me. You know, you always want to have uh, you always want to be first on something. So I think, uh, you know, if you if you want uh, your Bengals news centralized, that's the easiest place to get it. And that's right. Like he said, it's easy. You get all your news centralized from one source that's not social media. And you just go to cleveland.com slash bangles and you click on the blue banner at the top of the page to sign up. It takes a minute. You get a two-week free trial to start. After that, it's $4.99 a month. So if you don't like me, if you don't like Andrew, you don't like Mike, you're not hurting our feelings. That's why we do the free trial to your benefit. And I promise once you start, you're going to see that benefit and stick with it. So go to cleveland.com slash bangles. So normally, we make Thursday our little sort of informal Joe Burrow day on this podcast. I'm not saying Wednesday is going to be like our Jamar Chase day, but I think just for today, because there's a lot of things I've been kind of thinking about that we can discuss, we'll make today Jamar Chase day. We talked about him a little bit yesterday because he basically, in short, said he wants to break as many receiving records as he can only in year three. Uh, he's he's definitely come close, and he's definitely making his way up there, you know, being with the uh, top ten receivers in Bengals history, if he's not there already, top five 
you know, he'll definitely climb there. Um, he's getting there, especially what being three years in the league is, is just crazy. But here's the thing, even though it's May and, you know, a lot of these websites like DraftKings and these sports books don't start setting the lines for like how many receiving yards or touchdowns or catches a guy's going to make until, like I said, you get closer to training camp and preseason. We're going to be that source. We're going to be the sports book. So I'm just curious, like, kind of going stat by stat. Like, if you're thinking right now about Jamar Chase, how he's done in the last two years, and the potential he has in year three, like, if you had to kind of set the line for how many receiving yards he was going to have, where would you kind of set the line for Jamar Chase, like, right now in this moment? Uh, You know, I think if you had to set it, I, I would probably set it somewhere shy of, of 1,400. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you look at his his per game totals over the last two years, he's actually been uh, pretty consistent uh, and, he, and he did it in, in two different ways. Uh, you know, in, in his rookie year in 2021, you know, he had 81 catches, uh, which, you know, in uh, 1400 and uh, 1455 yards. God, I'm tongue tied here. Um, you know, and then he had so that I mean, that accounts for 85.6 yards per game. That was when defenses were still kind of figuring out how to play the Bengals, what you have to do against them. Then in 2022, as teams ran more too high safety looks, they tried to take the top off and, uh, you know, just or I guess put a lid on the uh, on the Bengals offense, kind of keep everything underneath. Uh, Jamar Chase actually had six more catches in five less games, um, but he had about 400 less yards, but he still had the same amount of yards per game. So he he's kind of comfortably around that 85 87 uh yards per game marker and i think that that's a good place to kind of have him at um you know so if you just have him at 86 times 17 uh that's 1462 if you account for a game missed or something like that i think that kind of puts you just shy of 1400 so i'm going to say you know i'd be good with 1390 i think is a fair number um, I think if I were to if I were to be placing the number personally, I would lean under on 1390. Uh, I think that, um, you know, you, you've got some some pretty significant receiving talent there. Obviously, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, you just drafted uh, Charlie Jones to kind of be another option for you. You would assume that, you know, a guy of, of his age is going to be able to come in and play immediately. So, yeah, I think I, I would go 1390. Uh, thereabout, and if I had to set it that, I I would probably go just under in terms of uh in terms of picking his over under. Mike, is Andrew's math on par, or do you think there's a better way to look at this? Yeah, no, I I, I think he's in the in the ballpark. I might set it higher, just because um if he was healthy both seasons, he would what he would have had last year fourteen eighty one around there, um and you expect um I think the passing game to take a step forward um you know i could comfortably see you know 1500 being the over under and and being a real question as to what you you'd put i think um jamar chase could have a um you know another record breaking season he already owns the single season record uh for receiving yards uh for the bengals uh that he set in his rookie year with uh 1455 yards um you know i i think it's going to be real close to around there um, I was looking at the overall numbers and um, 1,500. There was the top three receivers did that last year, Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill, and Devontae Adams. Uh, he's certainly in that class. And and I think if, um, you know, without Hayden Hurst, without Samaje, uh, I think he'll have some more targets, even though they did, you know, out of obviously a receiver in the draft, I don't see Charlie Jones necessarily taking catches away from, from Jamar Chase. So, so you're saying you'd set the line at 1,500? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. And Andrew, you said 1390. Is that what you said for your number? Yeah. You know, I, I just think that, uh, you, like, I understand, you know, you, you have to assume health with everybody. But, I mean, you miss one game because of a sprained ankle. I think, you know, it, it's fun when you when you do betting over-unders. And we're going to have more betting talk as, as we get closer to the season. And, and, you know, Vegas actually has legitimate lines. You know, I think it's fun to talk about over-unders. And, I mean, what do they say? Life's too short to bet the under. So you always like to say, oh, well, of course this guy is going to go over. Of course this. But, you know, if it, I just think that if, I mean, you miss one game, you're in trouble. And, um, you know, it's it's a 17-game sample size. And I think that, uh, 
you know, you, you kind of almost have to bake that in for, for non quarterbacks, just because, you know, one game is, uh, I mean, that, that's a huge deal. You, you've got to make up some significant ground if, uh, if that's gone. Yeah, I think that's fair because obviously, like, you know, Jamar missed four games with the hip injury he had last year. And again, he still came. Uh, actually, he surpassed his uh, rookie catches, which was 81. He had 87 last year. And we'll get to the catches part in a second. But yeah, I mean, I like what Mike said about the fact that the passing offense is going to take a step forward because no Hayden Hurst. No Samaj P. Ryan, both of whom were pretty big targets, not named Jamar Chase or T. Higgins or Tyler Boyd. I mean, that doesn't change anything for T. Higgins or Tyler Boyd. They're still going to do what they're going to do in the offense. But I still think you open up more opportunities to Jamar, you know, not and you know, taking anything away from Irv Smith, obviously, or Chase Brown or whoever's behind Joe Mixon. Of course, Mixon as well, you know, had a lot of catches last year. I think he had a career high in receiving yards. I uh, forget the number off the top of my head, but I mean, there's options there, but I feel like the the good line to set for receiving yards is somewhere between what you guys are saying. I'd say 1,400, 1,450, because um, I know what, Andrew said 1,390, Mike said 1,500. I think 1,450 is good, especially given like that's right on par with what he had his rookie year, 1,455 yards. So I think that's a good line to set. And Andrew, you said under, is that what you said? You think he goes under the number that you set or the line that you yeah, set? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to say it's drastically under. And I think, you know, just because, again, if, I mean, you can, I mean, Jamar Chase can have an outstanding season, right? Like he can average 90 yards a game and 90 yards a game, if he rolls an ankle and misses two weeks, that's 1350, you know, that that's an under right there. And and 90 yards a game would be the best average of his career. You know, so theoretically, like you can have, I just think it, it's a little bit insurance to bet under because if if you bet over on, on numbers, you know, unless it's ridiculously low. Uh, and by the way, if you think something is ridiculously low and you're smarter than Vegas, no, you're not. Um, <laughs> we're, we're making this up on the fly. But, you know, if it, I, I just think that unders are typically safer in these type of situations. Um, you know, so I, so I, I put it at 1390 just as kind of a, a baked in, you know, what if he misses a game? I think that that's kind of fair. Um, I would still lean under just in case, but, you know, I think if you start to get it towards, I don't know, maybe closer to 1200, 1300, even. Yeah. Then I start to look over. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you lower it like that, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, here's kind of a tangent. Well, Somewhat of a tangent, I guess. Not too much of a tangent. So you mentioned being smarter than Vegas. Uh, Two-part question, because I'm genuinely not like a betting expert. I've never bet before. But like when you say Vegas, like is it actual humans who set these lines? Or is there like an algorithm or a computer that does this? Because I know you know more about this than I do, Andrew. Is that how it works? Um, like, I, So I don't know the exact intricacies of it. But I know it's, I mean, it's not, you know, some dude in a, with a calculator in the back room. Like there are algorithms. <laughs> there's a bunch of different numbers um, that go into it. There, There's kind of... Um, there, there's algorithms, there's a bunch of different statistics that they have that are just, it, it's unique to try and, um, you know, it's unique to try and figure out uh, just how they do it. And that, I mean, people spend their lives trying to do it and they still can't do it. So, uh, I mean, the whole point of a line is to try and get movement on it. You know, so I think, you know, if, if memory serves, I think like the Colts beat the Chiefs in like week three or something like that. And I remember going into that. You know, the Colts had a, a pretty disastrous first couple of weeks, um, you know, and I, I just kind of remember like going into that game and everybody was like, why is the line? The line was like four on that game. And, you know, for a team that finished four, 12 and one or whatever they were, um, you know, they, they beat the Chiefs who were the Super Bowl champions. So th there's always a line to try and get movement. So, you know, it's not you you don't want people to look at it and say, Hmm, that's too hard and walk away. You know, you, you try to find an enticing option and, uh, and kind of go from there. So it's, it, it moves up and down as the, as the, as the public bets on it, you know, so if the Bengals open as three point favorites against the Browns and everybody hammers the Browns, uh, then that line is going to shift more towards the Browns. So it starts off with, you know, with a bunch of numbers and a bunch of fancy computations and then, you know, as the public kind of takes it, it can go a couple different ways. 
So the reason why I asked that is because, I mean, you probably know where I'm going with this. AI is allegedly going to take over the world and run the face of the earth. So I wonder what that means in terms of like odds makers and betting. Like, I'm just trying to think if AI would even impact that. And if it does, like, how would it impact that? I think would be kind of interesting. I have no um, idea. And I don't think we're going to know until really, who knows? We don't even know when we're going to know. So we really don't know nothing. The computers are going to beat us to it. Robots are going to run the world. Just kidding. Uh, back to the order of business. So we talked about the receiving yards there. So I want to kind of set the line for the other two main categories, of course. Touchdowns, tutties, greedy celebrations. Well, I will get to that part. But touchdowns and receptions. So if you're setting the line for receptions for Jamar Chase, like we did with receiving yards, where would you set the line and why? I think you'd go 100 um, just because he's had, what, 80, what was the exact number? 81 and then 87. And uh, even if he's not uh, fully healthy, you know, he would have, I mean, if he played two more games last year, he probably would have had 100. Um, so I think that's Easily. Um, a, a pretty fair range. I'm trying to see how many receivers hit that last year. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine at 100, at least 100 catches last year. Um, so I, I'd put it at a hundred just cause I think that would, like Andrew said, encourage betting. Um, I'd probably take the over just cause like I said, if he plays 15 games, you'd expect him probably to hit it. Would you set it over or under a hundred, Andrew? I guess what, I mean, what would your line, line was, if the line for me was a hundred, I, I actually probably lean over, um, you know, and I know that really? kind of what I said, I just think that, you know, when you, when you look at how defenses played the Bengals last year, um, you know, and kind of what teams did, the Bengals really just kind of proved that they were okay with saying, all right, you know, if you're not going to let us throw deep, you know, we'll just, we'll just get the ball to, to some of these guys in, in short yardage. Um, you know, I mean, you look at the games, I mean, there was a stretch where he had seven, seven, eight, seven, 10, seven, eight, eight, like they get him the ball pretty significantly and pretty consistently, um, you know, so I, I, I would actually probably put it at more like 105, 110, um, just to kind of, you know, you, you do encourage a little bit of that. Just when you look at how defenses played them, you know, the, 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 it's not one of those situations where, you know, Jamar Chase is just running, uh, you know, is just running nine routes the whole game. Like they're, they're getting him the ball underneath and that kind of lends itself to to more catches, to more playing time. You don't have to tap out if you're if you're running, you know, three go routes, three nines on the same drive. So yeah, I I think that uh, you know I would actually probably put it at like one ten or something like that. Uh, I would be I would be pretty okay with taking it over on a hundred. So you based on what you guys are saying, setting it at a pretty high line, and Andrew saying you'd take the over, kind of revisiting what I asked yesterday. So at that point there's a really good chance he can break TJ Hushmanzada's single season reception record, which is 112. What would you say? Would, would you say over or under that he breaks the record? I guess since we're talking over or under. Uh, like I said yesterday, I think he has a chance. I, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say over 113 or 112, um, I, but I think that he's um, um, going to, you know, in, in, in line to sort of have that as, you know, uh, that's a fair goal, I think. What about you, Andrew? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a fair goal. I, I guess I'd – I mean, it, it's pretty close. Like, if you kind of do the math and say, okay, you know, if he averages, you know, let's say seven and a half catches a game or something like that, I mean, that gets you pretty close. Like, if you play um, – you know, if you get seven and a half catches times, um, times 16, uh, that's – that's 120 yeah. um as they do quick math so i mean that gets you over um if you miss two games then you're starting to get close but i i say over uh i think i think you know i think he's got a pretty good shot to break it this year it just seems like receivers are making more and more catches and i don't just say that as like a figure of speech like you look at michael thomas i mean he set the nfrc receiving record like what four years ago made 149 catches then cooper cup was just behind him two years ago with that 145. And then, I mean, look at Justin Jefferson, who I think we, we can make the case even that um, Jamar Chase won't agree with us on this, but, like, he's probably the best in the game right now. And he led the league in receptions last year, 128 catches, which that already alone puts him seventh all time. So it's just like, man, Jerry Rice had that record, and then you had 
Herman Moore from Detroit. And it's just like, man, that, that record's going to keep moving and moving because I think, like you said, the way offenses are run now and the way defenses play guys like that, it just opens up the doors. So, like, the way I kind of look at number one receivers, top receivers, just trending upward and upward, yeah, I think having a high line like that of 100, even 100-ish catches and going over that – is not unrealistic. I, I think he easily goes over that line. I think he even goes over 112. How far up, I don't know. I Just because you have so many weapons that those other receivers don't necessarily have by their side that aren't named Jamar Chase, I think he doesn't go over like 115, 120. But, oh yeah, over 100, assuming he stays healthy and has the best year of his life with Joe Burrow. Not unrealistic. Uh, before we kind of go to break and uh, get to our special interview, which I've been waiting for uh, for quite some time as well, I mean, touchdowns. This is the fun one, and I think there's a lot of debate here, but what would you set the line as for Jamar Chase's total touchdowns next year? You know, I think touchdowns, I mean, they can be kind of fickle. Um, you know, we've, I like we've that seen word. that with a couple different receivers. Um, you know, I know Julio Jones was somebody who famously, you know, in his NFL career struggled with, with scoring touchdowns. And, and I'm, I mean, obviously that's nothing against Julio Jones. Julio Jones is one of the best receivers to ever play. Um, you know, I, and obviously, you know, Jamar Chase is on a better team than, uh, than Julio Jones. I think you could maybe argue ever was, uh, so, you know, he, he's obviously benefited by that, but I think, you know, the, I, I think it's it's fair to say, you know, nine and a half. You know, we had nine last year. You know, basically, does he get double digits? I think that that's a, a pretty fair goal to set. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. It. You know, I was looking at you know double digits is pretty hard to come by. Uh, last year, uh, Adams Devontae Adams led the league with fourteen receiving touchdowns. He was only only five receivers with um or four receivers with ten or. or Sorry, three receivers with 10 or more, two of them were tight ends, uh, Travis Kelsey and George Kittle. So you can see how rare there was. Jamar Chase actually had nine, was in, was tied for for sixth in the in the entire NFL, and he you know, only played 12 games. So could be easy, easily go uh to a higher number. But I I mean, you, you know, just based on how teams defend you, it could go could go lower. I think, you know, probably eleven would be fair, you know, eleven or ten uh to set it. And um I'm not sure which way I'd go. I just think it's a hard hard bet to make just based on, you know, your, your how many chances you get in the game, how many targets you get, you know, it's, it's just tough. Yeah. That, that's a hard one. That, that is actually really tough, but by the way, this is actually a fun fact, not to get into the whole Mount Rushmore of stats, but you know, who actually has the most receiving touchdowns in a single season in Bengals history. And it's probably not who you think it is. I just want to see if you guys know the most, uh, the most receiving touchdowns. In Bengals. Um, it's not who we think it is. The most receiving touchdowns in Bengals history in a, a season. season in a yeah, single Paul, season. Paul Pickens in nineteen ninety five. Oh, you look that up, you cheater! No, I did when we were doing. Well, it was for a previous story, but yeah, I knew I knew it from a, from very past coverage. All right, thanks, Mike. All right, yeah, actually, okay, Mike had me there. I was about to say, like, you did. I, I would have. Expect you didn't make something up, but you had that on the fly, so I, I I believe you there. Yeah, Carl Pickens, not AJ Green, not TJ Hushmanzada, not Chad Ochocinco, Carl Pickens, and I mean, <laughs> he's with some pretty elite company. Like I'm looking at it right now, like Chris Carter, Jerry Rice. I mean, those even Randy Moss, his rookie year, which still blows my mind. Like they all had the same amount of touchdowns. 17 in their respective years that they had it. Um, I don't think anyone's gonna get close. To Randy Moss's 23 touchdown record, I mean, Jerry Rice is obviously right behind him with 22. I think the closest anybody got to that was Devontae Adams in 2020. He had 18, which puts him third all-time behind Randy Moss and Jerry Rice. But, yeah, I, I think that's a tough one. I mean, because obviously he had fewer last year because of the injury, fewer than he did his rookie year, went from seven to – no, that's attempts, I'm sorry. Uh, went from 13 to nine, so definitely a dip there, but – I mean, what if he had 13 touchdowns his uh, rookie year and nine last year? Yeah, I I think he uh, – this is a tough one. I don't want to say he touches Carl Pickens' record, but he gets close. Like, I could see him maybe getting 15, maybe, maybe, maybe 16, but I think Carl Pickens is – he's not going to lose that record quite yet. Like, I think Chase will get there. 
I just don't think it's right now. Maybe if there's a world without Tyler Boyd and then you put in Charlie Jones after 2023, maybe. I don't know. That That's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm not a better or a gambler, but that is a tough bet to make. So I'm going to let people do that on their own, and I'm just going to sit back, watch, and observe and do this podcast. Uh, speaking of this podcast, we have a special guest joining us, and that is Bengals rookie running back Chase Brown, who had a very moving and insightful conversation with me uh, earlier. It's a great conversation you don't want to miss, and we'll have it right here when we come back on the Strictly Stripes podcast. And welcome back to the Strictly Stripes podcast. I'm joined by Bengals rookie and fifth round draft pick Chase Brown. Chase, welcome to Cincinnati. Good to meet you. How are you doing today? Man, nice to meet you. I'm doing really well. Just finished up the first day of rookie minicamp. Excited to get to work. I mean, tell me about it. You just finished up. Uh, looked like you were really explosive. You were moving really well in practice. Uh, kind of what did you like about just the way you were moving today with just the coaches and, you know, working with Justin Hill? Right. Um, I mean, that's fresh legs for you right there. <laughs> but other than that, it was just it was good to move around a little bit. Uh, get a feel for, you know, what practices will be like in the future and, you know, just keep stacking days. That's the most important thing. You know, you build on on one day and you know 10 days from now you know you know i'll be better than i was when you when, when you first got to cincinnati and you first made it you know to paycor stadium what was your first impression what was going through your mind as you're walking into the building and realize like this is real like this is actually happening yeah, so i actually came in the night before and i was just taking it all in i saw I saw the stadium i mean i saw all the stadiums here i didn't realize there were so many but you know i just felt blessed you know there's a lot of work that went into this and um, there's still a ton of more work to do, so um, just excited to be in a new city, a new state, and you know, just want to add to you know the, the the great culture that this you know championship caliber team has. You know, obviously the journey with you and your brother and your family has been very well documented. All your struggles getting to this point. I mean, obviously there's still a lot more work to be done. But how much do you kind of let yourself celebrate all that hard work and all that hardship you went through, you know, making it to a place like Cincinnati? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the main thing is, you know, we, we rarely celebrated anything. And there's just so much more work to do and just a lack of, satisfi- you know, we're, we're rarely satisfied from where we are. We're always trying to chase more, um, figure out what we can do next to get better. So, you know. We did sit there and, you know, kind of reflect with our family. But, you know, just we just knew that this was just us getting our foot in the door. And there's just so much more work to do. So um, I think that satisfaction will come at some point. But right now, it's, you know, I'm just hungry to, to learn, hungry to get around the, the guys and, you know, put in work. You know, you mentioned the word hunger. Do you feel like that's kind of fueled by a chip on your shoulder? Do you feel like kind of not being satisfied puts like a chip on your shoulder in some ways? I would say chip, but, you know, I guess you could I, you, you could say that a chip on your shoulder, always trying to prove yourself even even when I don't have to. I think that's that's what I, I find myself doing a lot, just trying to just compete, be the best any way possible. I know when we first talked to you on the phone when you got drafted, you said that Joe Mixon was a guy that you watched growing up. Um, kind of talk more about that. What do you like about his game? And, you know, I guess kind of how surreal is it playing with a guy that you said you watched kind of growing up? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it is it is surreal. Still doesn't feel real yet. Is I'm still letting it sink in. But, um, you know, he, he's a great running back. And he's been successful in this league. So, you know, being around somebody of that caliber, um, watching them, seeing how they work, what they do off the field, how they treat their body. Um, you know, I'll be paying attention to that and trying to learn from them going forward. I guess, you know, I was going to say, to that note, have you actually talked to Joe Mixon? Has he reached out to you? Like, have you talked at all? Um, yeah, so yeah, he actually texted me draft day. He was one of the first people to text me. He just said, welcome, let's get to work. And let's go, let's, you know, let's go get this ring. And that's the mentality here. You know, we're not, we're not just playing to, to win. You know, we're, we're, we're playing for a championship. We're, we're playing to, to take this all the way. I mean, obviously, every rookie comes in, no matter what team they play for, they want to come in and win a championship. But with the elevated expectations of this being a team that was just in the Super Bowl, that was this close to getting back to the Super Bowl last year, does it add a little bit of pressure? Or how do you kind of balance like those expectations playing for a, you know, a championship-caliber team like the Bengals? Yeah, I don't think it's pressure, but 
I think that's that's the the biggest thing is that there's there's an expectation that you got to live up to, you got to practice with, um, and just to keep that in the back of your head during everything you do, whether it's a workout or a practice or you know indie, just know that you got to give it championship effort, and you know you don't want to look out look back six months from now and think you know I could I could have done this better, I could have I could have spent more time here, I could have you know I could have been better, you know just you know put it all in sacrifice your time um separate yourself and you know i think that's what everybody's doing here chase my last question for you is you know there's a lot of things people don't know about you but what is something that people don't know about chase brown that they need to know you know as you're a cincinnati bingle now um <laughs> what do you want to know about chase brown maybe you put that in a poll and i'll answer it for you again <laughs> later on we probably should do that. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. And then I'll answer it on Twitter or something. Chase, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, yeah, buddy. Appreciate you. Take care, guys. Don't go away. We'll be right back on the Strictly Stripes podcast. All right. All right. Three, two, one. It's thanks for staying with us on the Strictly Stripes podcast. Had a great time talking with Chase Brown, who I'm sure we're going to hear from a lot more in the coming days and weeks with uh, workouts and OTAs and minicamp in the coming month. Um, always a pleasure with him. We also heard from Cal Adamitis on Tuesday. So if you missed that conversation, you could tune into that podcast and hear from him. That was also a great talk. We have many more to come, so stay tuned. Uh, but guys, we talked a lot about Jamar Chase, talked a lot about betting numbers probability so i want to spin that into another conversation that kind of requires some different approaches and a lot of theoretical ideas and that is i was thinking so we had the nba draft lottery yesterday where obviously they determine who's going to get the top five picks in the uh is it top five or top 10 either way top five top 10 picks in the nba draft i think it's top five it's, it's the non-playoff teams yeah non-playoff teams Oh, so they get all the non-playoff teams and they decide the top four from that, right? Is that how it is? Yes, correct. Yeah, um, yeah so when, you, when you look at the playoffs, I think there were like the, the lowest ranked team had uh, like less than a 1% chance and the three highest ranked teams, they were the Pistons, the Rockets and the Spurs. Uh, they had a 14% chance. Each league varies differently, but um, you know, of the, of the, there, there were 14 teams in the lottery that had a chance to win it. So that that's what I was making sure to clarify is non-playoff teams to determine the top four picks in the draft. So it's not like the NFL where the worst team automatically gets the number one pick. It's not like that. You could be the worst team and still land at like three or four. So I was thinking about it. Like I said, the NFL doesn't do that. It's just very simple. Worst to best determines, you know, picks one through 32 pending any previous trades or forfeitures for any penalties or whatever. That's just how it is. Worst from best first to last in the draft. Um, so I was thinking, should the NFL move in the direction of doing a draft lottery where you get non-playoff teams, like teams who don't make the playoffs from either conference, and you do a lottery to determine, okay, who are going to be the top four picks? Like, should they move in that direction? Or do you think that's a very risky approach? Um, there's a lot of people who who are very in. Um, I think that obviously the Wimbanyama thing, uh, you know, and to a lesser extent, the Connor Bedard thing in the NHL that just happened. I think that that kind of rose, uh, that kind of gained a lot of people's attention because, I mean, those are two, you know, two obviously varying degrees, two very different, uh, you know, approaches to kind of this year's draft. You know, like with this year's draft, you know, hey, is Bryce Young the number one pick? Is CJ Stroud the number one pick? Like in in the NHL it was okay. Whoever, whoever gets the number one pick is taking Connor Bedard and they have a franchise center. And in the NBA, it was okay. Whoever gets the number one pick is taking Victor Wembanyama, and they have maybe one of the best players in the league immediately. So it, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's hard to say that the league would suffer from it just because the NFL is as a machine is so good at drawing attention 12 months of the year essentially right like july through february i mean all you're interested in is is football like 
other leagues stay away from the NFL if possible, because you don't want to have your times conflict with theirs, right? Like no NBA games, no NHL games happen on Super Bowl Sunday at six, like six o'clock at night or, or uh, beyond because nobody wants to go up against that Super Bowl. Like everybody's afraid of it. And I think that if the NFL did it, I mean, you put the draft lottery in June I mean, you're talking about a league that has made the scouting combine a spectacle, free agency a spectacle, the draft, uh, the schedule release is now like a week long, basically. Like the draft lottery would be crazy. I just don't think it's a good idea. Um, you know, I, I look at kind of how things can change. I think it's the NBA number one and the NFL's number two, just in how quickly you can turn things around. Uh, baseball and hockey take a little bit longer. So I just don't, like the notion of like you know i'm trying to think of a good example here like of a team that finishes seven and ten kind of jumping the line and getting caleb williams going into next year right like i i think it would kind of leave i i mean i guess this is kind of a good comparable um you know imagine if next year the patriots miss the playoffs and then all of a sudden the patriots get caleb williams like I just don't like that. I've never really been a fan of lotteries. I don't think that they're the way to do it, especially in the NFL where tanking isn't really as much of a problem as it is in the NBA or you know, I guess even Major League Baseball. So, yeah, I, I'm just not in favor of it. I'll be more concise. No. <laughs> yeah. Why not? I uh, it's still, why would you I don't understand I mean Andrew kind of answered his own question they have interest year round anyway so they really don't need it it's a worse system than what they have now for competitiveness fairness uh league balance and uh the NBA stinks so I mean what do you need it for wait not the tangent here but why does the NBA stink like why do you not like it I mean most of the teams are bad there's uh, you know, I... it's not- it's it's just not exciting. Um, you know, they average less than 1.6 million fans per game. The NFL averages more than uh, 16 million dollars, 16 million viewers per game. I know. Well, hold that thought happening. because they have a bigger arenas or bigger stadiums. NFL stadiums are just naturally bigger. Are you talking about TV or in Te- person? Television audience. Oh, they I'm don't sorry. I thought, I thought... 1.6 million in a in an NBA arena. I didn't hear. I thought um, you said thousand. I didn't hear the number so, right. Uh, you know, I don't see why you take notes. Uh, when you're the one driving sort of the innovation and, and things like that would be just a complete step backwards. Makes no sense. Yeah, I know the people trying to say that they were in favor of an idea is, oh, well, you know, the NBA draft lottery gets a lot of views and a lot of ratings, which is true. I mean, like the numbers don't lie. They actually do get good ratings, but you have the combine. You have the, the draft in and of itself is three days and trumps what you get with the nba draft like it's more rounds obviously but even if you take day one of both drafts nfl draft wins every time it gets more views it's on more channels like nfl network espn even abc i think gets it like especially those last two days i mean more viewers the super bowl alone (laughs) like just the ratings go up more and more by the year i think the super bowl last year was the most watched ever in Super Bowl history, and the Bengals-Rams one the year before that was tops, so it just seems like each Super Bowl is more and more popular. Um, And then, like, I could see where maybe there's a lull between, well, no, I'm thinking of the wrong day, but the point is, yeah, even if you have, like, that little lull between the Super Bowl and the Combine, it's like, what, three weeks? And then there's only a month between the Combine and the draft? Like, that's not really a lull in my opinion, so... Um, by the yeah, way, I, I don't think any of the information you gave about the Super Bowl ratings was correct. Just wait, are to, you sure? Just to clarify for readers, uh, the you mean 2021 listeners. Super Bowl, uh, or what is it? Yeah, 22 was last year, so both of those got less than or so 22 was the Bengals that got less than 40 million. The record, I think, was 2015, which was like 47. It's kind of gone up and down, but yeah, no, it does not rise every year, uh, like you were saying. Wait, I, um, and obviously, wait, 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 where did you read that? Where did you see impacting that? that? Like, it could be total viewers, but linear ratings, like TV ratings, that's not not true. So but, I meant total viewers. No, no, that's what I meant. No, the ratings are different. I'm sorry, I right, wasn't but like total viewers, like in terms of like ten years ago, doesn't really. That's not 
how that works. Like, you know, you can't compare them because, you know, it's a different viewership. I, just going by TV ratings, that's just not how that works. They yeah, I, th that's fair. No, that's a good clarification. No, that's, yeah, I wasn't specific. Thank you for catching me on that. Although I did see that the ratings from the Bengals Rams Super Bowl, they were up 8% from the year before which was the Buccaneers Chiefs one. Although I think that kind of makes sense because maybe COVID had something to do with that. Um, I don't know how much higher the ratings went this year. I didn't get a number on that. But like, like I said, the, the the viewer total, that's what goes up. I was thinking about that. You take ratings and viewer totals from the Super Bowl, and I'd imagine it's just as good, if not better, than the NBA Finals. And again, I know it's different because the NBA Finals is not one game. It could be anywhere from four to seven, but like, even if you average it out, I still think the Super Bowl is king. The point is, there, there's a lot to keep you entertained. All the seasonal games, preseason games, I don't think you need that. Now, as far as like why I think it would be bad and why I think it would be unbeneficial, if that's even the right way to describe that, like to the system now is like, let's go to 2019, for example. This is applicable to the Bengals, and that's why I'm using this example. Okay, 2019, that number one pick is going to come down to, you know, at the time you think – the Bengals or the Redskins, or not the Redskins, excuse me, the Washington Commanders at the time that was their name, excuse me, Washington Commanders and then the Miami Dolphins. So what if the Bengals still finish with the worst overall record, 2-14, and 14, which they did, and then somehow you do this lottery, like with them and other non-playoff teams, and like the Detroit Lions, I think, who got the sixth or seventh pick in that draft, they, they get the top pick. I mean... They still had Matthew Stafford for one more year. So are you telling me, yeah, they could have drafted Joe Burrow. That would have still made sense. But like, then again, they still traded for Jared Goff. So it's like, did you need to draft Joe Burrow? What if it was, you know, the Washington commanders? They ended up getting Chase Young, which I think worked out okay for them. They could have used Joe Burrow too, but then you're also passing up on a guy like that who they really needed, I think still need right now. So to me, it's like, Joe Burrow is going to go somewhere and do great. I'm not saying he won't do well, but it's just like you're sort of plugging in teams that I think don't need to be in spots they don't need to be in. Like it's just – I don't know. It's it's hard to explain, but I well, guess no, – I, I See, I, I, I disagree. I disagree because like – I mean, so first off, uh, Ron Rivera I think was the coach at the time still, and he came out and said that if if the Bengals took you know Chase Young or if they took another quarterback, the, they were going to take Joe Burrow. Um, so – you know, I, I think it, I, I mean, obviously hindsight's 2020, it's very easy to say that, but um, you know, I, 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 and I just think that, I mean, if you're a team, like, you know, I use the Patriots as an example, if there was a draft lottery this year and the Patriots got the number one pick, of course the Patriots are going to take a quarterback, right? Like, I mean, the, the Cardinals did this a few years ago without the draft lottery where, you know, they picked 10th, they picked Josh Rosen. They were like, yeah, this probably isn't going to work. And then they got the number one pick and took Kyler Murray. So I, I just think that uh, you there, I mean, there might be an increase in player movement for sure, because if you have a team that moves up and, you know, maybe doesn't necessarily need a quarterback, then, um, you know, and you, I mean, assuming the number one pick is going to be a quarterback. I mean, I, I just think that, you know, guys are going to move more if, if that, if that's the case, because, you know, if you have a chance to upgrade a quarterback, I mean, absolutely. Everybody would take that. Yeah, I, I think the only good thing that could come out of something like this, if it were to happen, which it won't, is I, you could say it de-incentivizes tanking because, like, again, it doesn't happen frequently. It's very rare. It has happened. Like, the best example I think of is 2020, uh, Eagles were playing Washington in a very winnable game, and they benched Jalen Hurts for Nate Sudfeld because they wanted to get a higher draft pick, and I guess that's what they used to get Devontae Smith Again, which worked out for them. I mean, he's a big reason why they went to the Super Bowl, you know, on top of getting A.J. Brown in that trade with the Titans. But, like, that's a guy you need to get to that point. Kind of like how the Bengals got Jamar Chase with uh, the number four pick uh, in the draft. or Yeah, number five pick. I'm sorry, number five pick. So it happens. And you could say same thing with, I guess, the Buccaneers tank to get the number one pick, which they used to get uh, Jameis Winston 2015 rest of that is history but the point is it happens it's not frequent but it happens so maybe installing a system like this would say eh don't tank do the best you can even if you're 1 13 and 1 in absolute garbage with nothing else to play for play anyway because that's the spirit of the game
right, guys? It's all about it's all about winning, even if you're zero and sixteen for all you care, and it's week eighteen. You got to get that win, even if you go number one overall anyway, right? Too Something far. like that. <laughs> this, this is the the part where Muhammad just brings his passion out at the very end, even though I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. I just put a mic in front of me and say. Okay, we're going to talk about this topic. I'm going to act like I know what I'm saying. I'm just kidding, guys. I promise I do my legwork on this. Um, Stay with us because uh, we're going to actually get into Joe Burrow Day tomorrow. Uh, Jamar Chase had his fun today. It's going to be Joe Burrow Day tomorrow. But we're going to talk about a side of Joe Burrow that we have never talked about on this podcast that I don't think even most experts or so-called experts are even talking about. And I'm telling you, it's a side that you're probably not even thinking of. And that's why you want to tune in for this podcast tomorrow. I'm not going to say who we're going to have on, but someone who knows a thing or two about Joe Burrow. But once again, for myself, Andrew, and Mike, I'm Muhammad Amon. 